Welcome. Uh, thank, thank you for coming along today in what awful stormy weather we've got. Um, we also have quite a few people joining us online on Zoom. So hello to those on Zoom in the ether, wherever you are. Thanks again for, for joining us. Well, my name's Jude Dickin, and I'm Collections Information Manager for Manx National Heritage. And for the next 45, 50 minutes, depending if we chat, um, I'll be talking about unlocking our sound heritage at Manx National Heritage. Just to say you can also leave at any time, that's fine. I won't be offended. Okay. Can you hear that? Silence. People, the island, its history is not silent. It's full of sound and noise. Welcome to Unlocking Our Sound Heritage, a UK-wide project to preserve, digitally preserve, and provide access to thousands of rare and unique sound recordings. Funded by a 9.3 million grant, that's 9.3 million grant, from the National Lottery Heritage Fund and led by the British Library, Unlocking Our Sound Heritage aims to digitally preserve almost half a million endangered sound recordings from across the UK and the Isle of Man, making 100,000 of these available online. For the next hour, see it's creeping already, I said 45 minutes, for the next hour, we're going to learn how a century worth of sound and voices from the Manx National Heritage Sound Archive has been digitally preserved and unlocked. But most of all, we're going to eavesdrop and by doing so, appreciate the sensory power of sound heritage. Listen. in the parish of Maloo. Is that so? Yes. And who was living in that house? My husband's father and mother. Watterson's? Mm, Watterson's. Bella Robin. Bella Robin. Kirsty Neat, Helen Dethridge, Thursday 1st of June 1995 at the Quarterbridge pub, according TT 1995. Dan Acton has felt you to Greach or a guild. Greetings and a welcome to you all who love the Gaelic. Do you remember the military being at Castle Russian? Who? The military soldiers. Yeah, in Castle Russian? Yes. To <laughs> And you'd remember the barracks there? The barracks, yes. There's only the commission has only bought that lately, you see, but a few years. Just a few years they bought it. I remember there was one one company of soldiers in there, the, the second Manchester, they were five years in Castle Russian. Bit lost. Yeah, I'm a bit lost. It won't sink in this week. It's sinking next week when I go to go out and you go to meet someone and like I have to start ringing up now and saying to people where you're going if you're going out tonight. Whereas now always, you know, you come down here and they're going to be here. That was a compilation, <laughs> starting with children singing a Manx song and ending with a recording of the last night in Bushy's pub. Of clips chosen by me from the nearly 600 sound recordings now digitized. We'll hear four more compilations, but other than revealing my penchant for the miscellaneous, what do they orally reveal? They reveal the sheer diverse range of voices, sounds and subject matter captured in our sound archives. In fact, our first challenge early in 2020, when we were planning the project with National Museums Northern Ireland, they're one of the 10 partner hubs working with the British Library, was what sound archives to select, given there was funding for us to digitize up to 600 individual sound artifacts. 
Be not afeard. The aisle is full of noises. A line from Shakespeare's The Tempest came to mind as we decided to include as many different voices and sounds, talking about as many subjects in English and Manx from the recordings taken in the early 1900s to the 2000s. And what have we chosen to unlock of the Isle of Man's sound heritage? Well, what we've chosen will join the sound heritage as chosen by the other 10 partner hubs in the UK, as well as the British Library's own sound archive. So people will be able to enjoy our sounds alongside, you know, Cornish fishermen, Welsh miners, and I find that really quite, quite wonderful. Already by September 2021, Unlocking Our Sound Heritage had digitally preserved over 300,000 recordings from over 100 institutions, including 726 recordings for the Isle of Man. Now, you know when I said 600 sound archives? Obviously, a cassette tape can contain more than one track. So we're actually unlocking more than 600. We're getting our money's worth. Did I mention this is all free to us as well? So it's great. It wasn't just the content of the sound recording that swayed our selection. You may have picked up on the phrase digitally preserve, which, like a stuck record, I keep repeating. Stuck record is the point indeed. Audio heritage, or rather the physical carriers of that heritage, is at risk, which meant we prioritised the selection of the more vulnerable formats, such as reel-to-reel -reel tapes, vinyl, and even now, CD. Now, I don't know about you, but I grew up with tape cassettes and vinyl in my own personal sound archive of, of music. And I look at them at home now and think, gee, they're just artefacts now. I don't actually play my cassettes anymore. Um, anyway, so it's made me think, think about that, that kind of cassette I used to have. Anyway. Well, sound recordings are held on formats that are physically degrading. There's nothing you can do about that. That's just time. And where the equipment required to play them is no longer produced. There are also fewer engineers around to fix the playback machines that we have, which I find, again, quite, quite surprising, but it's true. Professional consensus internationally is that we have approximately 15, one five years in which to save the sound archives where any or all of these conditions apply before they become unreadable and are effectively lost. Unlocking our sound heritage at Manx National Heritage, as elsewhere, is about saving this island's sound heritage for now and future generations. And this is where the digital comes in. National Museums Northern Ireland is a centre of excellence in digital audio preservation. In this short film shot for us, audio digitisation officer Jonathan McBride explains just one of the processes, just one, he's applied when digitising our polyester tapes. Take it away, Johnny. Hello, Manx National Heritage. It's Johnny here from uh, National Museums NI. I'm the audio digitization engineer for the UOSH project, and I've been digitizing um, through all of your audio items. Um, this is just a short talk uh, about one of the problems that polyester tapes have, and it's called sticky shed syndrome. So um, polyester tapes may suffer from sticky shed syndrome, this is when the adhesive that holds the oxide layer um, of the tape to the backing layer absorbs moisture. So if you play a tape with sticky shed syndrome, you'll hear a squealing on the head and you can see where the tape has shed off um, on the head and along the tape path. And the damage to the tape is irreversible. Um, it's also hard on your replay equipment, um, so it'll all need cleaned down and checked. And if you digitize a tape while it's squealing, it actually results in uh, unwanted artifacts on your digitized file. 
So baking these tapes, we call it baking, but I'll, I'll go in and show you the oven and everything now in a second. Um, they can, it can temporarily, temporarily reduce the stickiness, um, so it enables you to, to get a replay for digitization. So that's about as steady as I think the camera work's going to be for this. Uh, so hopefully nobody gets seasick um, while we'll have a look around the studio. So, uh, so this is a, a tape we've got on on one of the Studer A807s. Um, so basically, we can get a good angle on that. So basically what happens um, is the tape that or item that needs uh, to be digitized is put onto the replay machine. And then the signal comes out the back here and it goes into the analog to digital converter, which is this white yoke here. And uh, then it goes from the analog to digital converter and then into the digital audio workstation, which is working away here at the minute. Uh, and then it's captured here and edited. So basically the edit just involves um, sort of topping and tailing it um, because it's you basically want an exact replica of what's you know I'm not enhancing it in any way um, just optimizing it so we'll go through so um, I'm not on my own in here this is uh, Sam say hello Sam oh, yeah. Sam's a cataloger on the UOSH project um, he's been working on some of your yeah. Manx stuff. What are you working on at the moment, Sam? Just working away on QCing some of the uh, the Manx stuff, some of the Nogan Parish stuff with John Quillian. Very yeah, good. Going well. All right, thank you, Sam. Uh, just while the door's open here, actually, I'll take you into this is our temperature and humidity controlled vault here. So you've got all the lovely roller racks and everything here. You can roller them. Um, so yeah, it's temperature humidity controlled vault where we keep all of our tapes. Um, humidity is kept at 50% humidity and uh, the temperature is kept at 16 degrees Celsius plus or minus one so it's the optimum ideal sort of storage conditions see those big vents coming down there and yeah and then just the last thing I'm going to show you is the what we call the oven they say it's an oven but it's it's really an incubator um, it's you can do it between sort of 45 to 60 degrees I I bake at 45 degrees um, for 8 hours and then that temporarily reduces the stickiness. You're supposed to get about 2 weeks out of it but I've found that it can start displaying signs of sticky shed syndrome after maybe about a week so I would tend to bake what I need for the, the next day um, and then yeah just uh, do them the next day. So that's the end of the video. Hope you enjoyed it. Bye. Who knew you could bake tapes, sound archives? When we went over to first deliver um, the, 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 the sound archives to two National Museums in Northern Ireland, so that was myself and Emma Le Cornu, who is our uh, archives conservator, when he showed us this oven, he was going to bake our reel-to-reels from the 1940s, 50s. It was, it's, it's been a real learning for us as well. Um, and working with Jonathan and the team at NMNI has, has been fantastic. Okay. Does this process improve, uh, include any noise cancellation and improvement? Because it looked to me as if it was just going through a, a, a analog to digital and then digital to um, another thing that never listened or improved. Yes, no editing takes place on the initial because we want to capture the authentic, um, the authentic authenticity of the original recording. However, as we're doing the listening again, there are areas where we thought we'd like to do some post-editing work on some of, certainly from recordings, we've got some as early as 1910, um, and there's like a shh in the background. So we want to capture the authentic first, so we have a master to work off, and that's protected, because it's always good to go back to the original, if you ever need to. And then absolutely, we are looking at post-editing work on some of them. Most of them actually sound okay, and sometimes the crackle is quite nice. The crackle of the recording, as long as it doesn't def deflect from the understanding of, of what's on the tape. Okay, but very good question, very good question. Where was I? Well, digitization 
is just one part of the unlocking. The other key element is cataloguing. Raising awareness of the importance and value of our nation's sound heritage happens when we make what is said discoverable through concise, keyword-laden, fully searchable written descriptions or catalogues, as archivists call them. Here's an example of a description field for an oral history interview done in 1998. I've highlighted some of the words to illustrate just how jam-packed, well, and there's, there's be, even better examples than this, but I just thought I'd stick with this, this one, how jam-packed full of people, places, and subjects one short interview can hold. All our sound recordings have now been described following the British Library cataloguing standard that contains many more fields than this. Too many to squeeze onto a PowerPoint slide, you'll be pleased to hear. Many of these descriptions are already discoverable on the British Library Sound Archive and Moving Image website, which you can look at now, and will also appear on our homegrown iMuseum website, but more of that at the end of this talk. Right clearance on all those who audibly perform and checking for any sensitive content are also part of giving responsible access to the sound recordings. And me and, and the team at um, M&H, Max National Heritage, has, has, have, we've more work ahead of us now that the digitisation bit is done. So we're going to be doing that really for the rest of this year. But this is where I need to give a very big shout out to our global team of around, well, it's around 60 um, listening volunteers. Some of you in the audience, listening volunteers? Oh, there's a few little hands going up. This is your bit. Well, together, together, remarkably, totting up the listening time estimate for each listening volunteer and an m &H team member gives to each description, and I've been doing some descriptions too. We've listened to 569 hours. That's 23 days of non-stop voices and sounds of the island's sound heritage. Amazing. Thank you. Without your joining us... Thank you. <laughs> Without your joining us we would not have unlocked in so short a time the rich content of the now over 700 uh, tracks, sound recordings, that begin, that begin to represent the Isle of Man sound heritage. Right, those are enough words about unlocking our sound heritage at Manx National Heritage. You'll be pleased to hear. For the rest of our time together, I want us to just listen to a selection of the digitally preserved sound recordings, preserved, not cleaned or edited, which I think will echo with us all as sound heritage earworms on this UNESCO World Day for Audiovisual Heritage. So let's listen. I will talk throughout, throughout some of them as well. I won't just leave you here to listen. You know, we'll, we'll have a chat about them, well. but let's listen. In Port St Mary, there were two net factories in my time, and in our time. Mike, you're fantastic. We can't say any more. There's no other superlatives that will go with it. On behalf of all of us here in the grandstand, again, verbally, congratulations, Mike. We really mean that. Thank you, Peter. Now then, what sort of a ride was it? Very hairy and much too fast. <laughs> much too fast. For sale, it was gilt meat. It was, it was three bullion for sale, it was, it was gilt meat, it was like gold and oil. Now I have heard the tale of old Bobby Bob and old his woman, Margaret Ann. Margaret Ann. She used to call him an awkward big slob of the butter sliver of his hand. And bless me soul, the fuss she'd make if he slayed it with a sum on a soda cake. She struck a reef to the south end of Kitterland and knocked the starboard bilge in and the two masts went over the side, killing the carpenter and breaking the leg of the second mate. I heard that it is a beautiful race and uh, 
nice uh, roads and uh, very nice uh, curves and uh, very friendly peoples. No, 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 the, the rats as a rat. Uh, what else can you? Long tail. Oh, well, anything could be a long tail. <laughs> <laughs> not only a rat that's got a long tail, you know. <laughs> what? You're not, are you? Are you superstitious? No, but everybody else seems to be. Oh, well, that's all right then. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I love that. Well, Mike Halewood, um, in that compilation, leads us neatly to the sounds of the TT. And we were keen when looking at a selection to represent TT, love it or hate it, it, you know, we're known for the TT. We didn't want it just to be about motorbikes. We wanted it to be about the wider sort of festival as well. And I think um, this very unscripted sound archive gives you a flavour of that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's the microphone. It should be fine. Uh, this is the third interview, Sunday the 7th. I have a bunch of people around me here. And um, where are you from? From Liverpool. From Liverpool? Yeah. Why are you here? For the TT. <laughs> For the TT? What? How extraordinary. No, we didn't yeah. come here to dress up. Oh, <laughs> no. We didn't come here to dress up. It's just an excuse. Yeah. We just brought one change of clothes on this <laughs> day. One Sorry, can you repeat that, please? We just brought one change of clothes and that's all we've got to dress yeah, up in. Yeah. 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 It's a 17th grade. 17th grade. It is. I brought a big special for you. Yeah, can we bother that? Yeah, where are you from? Sorry? Where are you from? I'm from Norway. Yeah, wait a minute. What are you doing? Here. Yeah. And now I'm a student, sort of. Ah. Sort of. So, so are we going to be on the radio? Sorry? Are we going to be on the radio? Are we going to be on the radio? Yeah, probably. We'll see. We'll see how it works. <laughs> Got all our 70s gear on it. We're going to have a great time. All right. Now, the reason I play it, you probably didn't catch all of it, but it's about sometimes what these sound archives do. They're not radio plays. They're capturing atmosphere. They're capturing the noises off. More of that later. So it's not just, you know, your, BBC, your Radio 4, you know, radio play programme or documentary or the Today programme. Sometimes it's the inconsequential stuff in the background. And, and I love that. Often when I listen to these, I close my eyes. And when I close my eyes to that, I'm at Bushy's tent. Oh, TT memories. Um, anyway, moving on. Um, Motorbikes, of course, are still what the TT is all about. It is. As with this memory of the TT 1930, which starts this next compilation. There was four of the fastest uh, uh, on, the, on the TT course uh, due through uh, within a few minutes, and I didn't want them passing me in a rainstorm at 130 miles an hour while I was on that track. Mrs. Gelling, and she sold good ale at a penny a pint. And they were awful thirsty people round there because they worked in the quarries and the lime works and they had a raging thirst of a night, so the pub was full. Is this on that chair? Nine. Nine, yes. Yes, nine will sit down. She won't sit on the cat. You need a kettle. <laughs> How evocative is that? It's a tea. It's just a tea. Right? Thanks, tea. It's a hunter then. You know, it went down to 144 verses. <laughs> and how we kill them, and how we catch them, and how we cook them, you know. That's a nice Steadford at the Braid. So the recording's poor, but it is at the, at the Braid, I think. Catching Kong is long and curly, and I'm told there's not the equal in the land. That last, does anybody know that song? 
Go on, shout out if you know it. The Pride of Port Lamoa. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. That was the song of the Pride of Port Lamoa, and that leads us nicely on to the fishing and the impressive haul of fishermen recorded over the years, many recalling the forests of masts and sail of the herring feet. I'd like to just listen to a few of these fishermen, very short clips again. Let's listen first to Edward, Edward Christian, and then two, after, Ed, after Edward, there's two very evocative memories from H. Corkle when he was a boy cook on a fishing boat, and this is all, all sails, you know, and, and hauling in the lines. I'll let you enjoy them. You know the length of the long line? The long yes, line. yeah. When you think of it, they were walking 800 hooks. Yes, yes. It's a lot of work, isn't it? Yeah. Four lines yes. a mile. Yes. I know my father told me once that there was one Easter, and the, it was flat calm, there was no wind. And uh, three or four days, they rowed out and rowed to shoot the, the lines and rowed to haul them and rowed back again. Hmm. And Jimmy Bradford told me that he was fishing then and he remembers after coming in on the Thursday before Good Friday and rowing all the way back in with the, for about the fourth time with the shot of fish. He went home, he sat down, and Beanie filled a basin of tea for him. There were basins yeah. then, of cups. And he said he just sat there looking at it, and he never drank it to this day. He mm. was asleep before he could even touch it. Mm. And she just covered him up in the chair and left him there. Mm. Right. It was hard work, oh, Walter. Well, and those fellows would be coming in, you see. If you get an old paper or an old courier, and have a look at the fish being landed in Ramsey yeah. in those days. It was four score. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the master Frank landed four score. Yes. That was 80 fish. Uh, yeah. Or another fellow might have five score, a hundred yeah. cod. Yes. Yeah. Well, that was a ton of fish. Yes, yes. They were big fish, weren't they? Yeah. Yes. Now just imagine them pulling yeah. a big boat yes. and a ton. Yeah. Pulling a ton through the water coming back. Yes, oh yes. It's a lot of hard work in it. Do you hear the clock ticking in the background? Often a lot, of, we'll come to noises off in a minute, but a lot of these recordings were, take, were done in people's ha homes and there's something quite delicious about that, I think, rather than in a, a sanitised studio. It's wonderful. Let's, um, now, these are my favourite. I love H. Corkill. He's a bit of a hero of mine. I love his, his dialect accent more than anything. So let's enjoy. Let's enjoy him describing being on a boat, um, just sailing out of Port St. Mary with the sails. He's a boy at this time. So it's just before or around the First World War era. It's that early. Um, but let's enjoy him and try and imagine the, the scene he's painting. It's wonderful. Around the supper and after supper, there's always a verse of a hymn or two verses of a hymn and prayer. This is on the boat. If there's a man in, a man there that was taking prayer or a man that was going to the prayer meetings, he would take the prayer himself. But otherwise, it was silent prayer. And then you would always have the prayer and the, and the verse of a hymn. And then after that, that's what they called finishing the day. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm going before my story yeah. when we were out. We weren't allowed to shoot until the uh, till the sunset, mm. and once the sun would start to set, every man would stand on deck with his hat off and say, "We thank thee, O God, for the day that's passed and gone, and for all the blessings that was given us. Be thou with us in the day that is to come, for Christ's sake, Amen." And then, when the sun would go down, we'd put our hats on, and then we start to shoot. Isn't that wonderful? Now that's something, we haven't got paintings of that, we haven't really got descriptions of that. So to have that sound archive, him, he was there, he saw it, that's what they did. And I love that idea of finishing the day, that's kind of stuck with me now. Anyway, final one from H. Corkill, which is um, 
more of a comical um, memory of when he was a boy cook on board. Now, when I was boat. cook first, I was down there, I was down coiling the rope, what they call the spring back. And uh, I'd be going to his Monday morning, and after, after eating pop and cakes and all at home with my mother, and I felt a bit sick, so one of them said, I believe the cook is sick. Navas is one of them. So Tom Bueller come down, and he said, what's wrong with the boy? I said, I'm not feeling well, Tom. <laughs> he said, there's no such thing as seasickness. It's freckin' the war, he said. Freckin' the war. He said, I'll take the fear out of thee. He said, and he took a rope in, and he built it in my behind, that I was freckin' to be sick afterwards. <laughs> That's the way they used to do with this. I'm to be, you're freckin' to be sick afterwards. That was hard treatment. It was, well, that's what they used to do, but it done us good. Had they no cure for seasickness? No, there's no cure for sickness, the seasickness. The only thing they used to do was, was just go up in the bow to the boat, and then uh, if they were seasick, was have a cup of tea without sugar or milk in it, just so they'd a drink of tea, and then it would, it would come up again, and mm. get right in the bow to the boat, which you'd be jumping up and down and up and down all the time. And that's the only way, only way you could cure it. You'd have to get used to it. What I like about that is he... He gives us an impression of the, of the captain of the boat. You're threatened, frightened. It took me a while. So what, what's he saying there? You're frightened. You're just frightened. Well, that's stayed with him over the years. He was an elderly, elderly man when he was recalling these memories. So again, it's, it's just a wonderful insight. Well, from seasickness to jam making at Russian Abbey in the 1940s, the 1940s, as recalled by the Garrett family of Balagloni, if I said that right, Balagaloni, I'm terrible at place name. Listen out for the bucket. You must have had other ways to, to boost your income. Did you pick blackberries for Russian Abbey? Well, that when we were kids, we were only school kids, we'd done that, like, you oh, know. Uh -huh. uh, my mother and sister would be, it would be, uh, you know, uh, gathering them and it's not far. It was a done thing, you know, around this district, uh, Richard Abbey, you know, and the yeah. war was on and I suppose food was scarce, so it was a, it was a done thing. John, you, you, uh, did you ever go out and pick uh, blackberries yourself? No, it's not, I didn't like my fingers getting black and prickled. What about the people around here then? Oh, that's all right. I didn't mind them picking them, making a bit of jam for you. What did they use to pick them into? <laughs> uh, the bucket was empty. <laughs> well, sure, tell me, the, tell me about the bucket then. Uh, the bucket was empty. Use the bucket, you see. What bucket? How are you? Uh, you were involved with Russian Abbey, weren't you? Oh yes. <clears throat> what were you doing there? I used to come home from school and go down to pick strawberries at night, uh -huh. and then all day Saturday. Four an hour we got. That was good money then, wasn't it? It was pretty good, yes. Yeah. Better, <laughs> better than rats, tails and uh, jam, was it? Well, it, it was good fun. Yeah. Uh, what was the jam like? Did it taste all right out of the bucket? The jam was good. <laughs> <laughs> Did you all try it? <laughs> Did you try the jam then? Oh, yes. Oh, I. Oh, why, that's a delicacy. <laughs> <laughs> Now, what I like about you can hear they're all giggling. Now, when they mean the bucket, I infer something from that. Was the bucket used for something else at home? What do you think? I don't know. But none of them, none of them mention it, but it's the unsaid. Oh, I love that. And then, of course, there's farming. And as with the fishermen, many a farmer and farmhand has thankfully been recorded about their time on the land um, when it was horse literally horsepower. Um, let's listen to Norman Collister of Craig Niche, and then, as it's turnip season, um, we'll listen to Gladys Neal recording, uh, re well, recalling thinning turnips as a girl. I was 14. Yes. Home then and put to work. Really? And you're working on the farm? I worked on the farm there. Yeah. yeah. And was it mainly arable farm? Uh, yes. It was all... And Kenick's place there too. I was 20 years there. Really? Yeah. Why? Well, ploughing with horses. Aye. Yeah. Yeah. Well, where did you get your horses from? Uh, did you we breed bought them? You bought them? Yeah. Did you breed any horses? Oh, I bred four or three or four myself. Did you? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So there was no sort of mechanised... No, there was no tractors, no nothing them days. No. Um, tractor, I don't know. 
And the nearest track to be down at Percy Cameron and the Kraggans or somewhere. Really? Yeah. 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 And did they all sort of dig in and help each other around here yeah. in the old days? Oh, I. Did they? Yeah. During the harvest and things like that? Oh, no, there wasn't much of that going on at all. What about no. pipe out? Huh? Yeah, you're right. What about pipe out? He's right, no. Uh, and, you uh, did too. Did you hear that? Yes, I Put that pipe out. Uh, it's a much knit community, I suppose. I wanted to try yeah. to weed the yeah. turnips. Oh, sorry. Let me escape. So, of course, I, I, I wanted to just stop that there because I'd forgotten how good a bit that is. Did, did you hear what she said? So, he's obviously talking with the pipe in his mouth, and she's looking at him, his wife, I assume, thinking, well, she can't hear, he can't hear what you're saying with that pipe in your mouth. Put that pipe out. Put that pipe out. And the fellow goes, he's all right. Let him go, he's all right. And I love that because, again, that's unscripted. You can't, you can't script that. Anyway, I'll take us back, take us back. Okay. Sorry, I, got, I get excited about that bit. Yeah, it's 14. Yes. Sorry, we're, we're Home to start then, again. put to work. Really? And you're working on the farm? I work on the farm there. Yeah. 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 And was it mainly arable farm? Uh, yes. It was all... And Kenyuk's place there too. I was 20 years there. Really? Yeah. Why? Well, ploughing with horses. Aye. And... Yeah. Well, where did you get your horses from? Uh, did you breed bought them? You bought them. Yeah. Did you breed any horses? Oh, I bred four or three or four myself. Did you? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So there was no sort of mechanised... No, there's no tractors, no nothing in them days. No. Um, tractor, and I, I don't know. And the nearest tractor would be down at Percy Cameron and the Kraggans or somewhere. Really? Yeah. 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 And did they all sort of dig in and help each other around here yes. in the old days? Oh, I. Did they? Yeah. During the harvest and things like that? Oh, no, there wasn't much of that going on at all. What about no. pipe out? Huh? You're right. What about pipe out? He's right, no. Uh, and uh, it would be sort of a, more of a close knit community, I suppose, in those yes, days. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, there was only James Caron when I went over there and John Kinley, the three of us was helping one another. Yes. Well, I can remember uh, Mr. L was it Bridie Lowey that used yeah. to live down there? He was over at the corner there. At the corner. Mm. He made 95. Did he really? Uh, yeah. He was my uncle. Was he? Uh, what was his occupation? Farming. He was farming too. Farming all his life. Was he? Yeah. Great. And now Gladys Neal. You did turnips? <laughs> yes, I did. I was sorry for that too. <laughs> I wanted to try to weed the turnips. So of course that was the biggest mistake. <laughs> I had to go regularly every day then to weed turnips. <laughs> oh, I didn't know it was so <laughs> How did you how did you weed the turnips? Did you have a hoe? Was it all back? No, no, your hands. Pull out so many and leave one and so more and more and leave one. Yes. It was quite easy, it wasn't hard to do it. Only you were on your knees scratching. <laughs> yes. Was this after school or in the holidays? In the holiday time, yes. There you go. I like Gladys. If any of you like thin turnips, I, I must admit I never have. I, I never did them, but I remember boys in my class at the last primary school did. Right, OK. It's so quite an industry on the island with, with school children going... Ah. Fantastic. Oh, there you go. Well, Gladys was one of those, and uh, yeah, there you go. Ha, huh, brilliant. Thanks for that. Well, time for another compilation. And a quick verse of Ellen Vannin, of course. They were all in favour of Caroline. You know, the publicity that they were, they were giving the Isle of Man, and in particular Ramsey, was, was tremendous. They would start broadcasting, so it was a lovely, lovely day here in, uh, in the Isle of Man. We're broadcasting four miles off Ramsey. That was great publicity for Ramsey. Um, as soon as they heard war broke out, they all, you know, all the people who'd been booked, even for, a, say, a fortnight, yeah. they just went home, panic. <laughs> Say, wish the dutton gear, 
Der wüsnes tre zal seeken zijn teil to schille die. And would spend a whole week with their children on the on the beach. We were just a few yards from the beach. Even if it was raining, <laughs> they'd been there, Wellingtons and Max, and had a whale of a time. <laughs> well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this, the harvest home at Kerakil. It was rather a uh, showery evening. Um, surely one of the most rural chapels and places of worship in the island and uh, up here on the Manx Hill side. Hello madam, um, Frank Sarebon here actually. I don't live in the Isle of Man, I live in Tipley, which is a bit like the Isle of Man, except there's no water around it. What in the world did you do that for, Gib? What are you going to do with a shack over here? And he said, a very nice place to send my wife and children for the summer. Well, the last voice we heard there was Janet Gibb, interviewed at her home, The Grove, Ramsey, in 1973, aged 95. She died the next year. This summer, I did a lunchtime listen at The Grove so we could listen to Janet to recall her memories of the house she had lived in since 1887, from the age of eight. There's Janet. Let's listen to just three of her memories, only short clips, of Ramsey Entertainment, the First World War, and a picnic in 1910. Then we'd go down to listen to news band on the promenade. It, uh, that was, yes, before the First World War. Uh, they were Germans, and they came over every summer from the middle of July to the, I think it was the beginning of July, to the middle of September. And everybody walked on the South Promenade and sat about and listened to them. And during the day, they used to go around and play at different places, perhaps in front of an hotel or perhaps at somebody's house who was generally rather glad to hear them and gave them money. They play in the Zair Road and collect from houses each side, you see, and so on. And we looked forward to their coming always. And they, some, sometimes the days the boat came to, uh, the, the direct boat came to Ramsey, they'd play at the end of the pier where people were all sitting waiting for the boat to come in, you know. And uh, at 10 o'clock we went into Mrs. What was her name? How oh, funny. Anyhow, we went into what is Melanie's now, I think, oh, yes. by Brews there. Yes. And that was at Cayley, Mrs. Cayley. And she didn't, she didn't mind as long as we, as we cleared out by 11, that was all that mattered. And we used to sit there from 10 till about 5 minutes to 11, and then we all made for home. And when you made for home, uh, did you... Did, did we walked. You walked? Yes. Uh, you didn't have the pony and cart then? No. No, no, we, we walked. Now that's what's wonderful about that. She's, she's describing herself as a young teenager in Ramsey. Now, of course, it's a German band before the First World War. And in my, in my way, I think, I think what happened when the world war started, obviously the German band didn't come over. What, what happened to those performers? Were they, did they, they find themselves in the trenches? fighting against, you know, people they used to entertain. Anyway, you can let your imagination go with this stuff. That's, 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 that's the other thing I, I find. Anyway, let's, let's carry on listening to Janet. For that first world war, there wasn't a man or a boy of suitable age left in Ramsey. 
the whole population had gone of its youth and the men. Uh, there were a few that couldn't go, but I, I remember in the papers, uh, Ramsey came second to one place in Scotland where there wasn't a man left in the village except one or two grandfathers because the youth of the village was just old enough to go and the other men all went. And Ramsey, men and girls, went. Alice went and worked in that munition factory at Chilwell where they had that awful explosion. Alice was Janet's sister. Um, she survived the war. Final, final um, memory from Janet, where she describes a picnic in 1910 in Rams, just, well, up north, down north, down north. Oh, let me go back. Then we'd go down to listen to news band oh, no. on the oh. promenade. See, I told you it would all go wrong. There we go, let's do that one. You were in your teens, you know, 15, yes. 16, and so on. Um, were there a lot of parties going on in the north here? Oh, yes, there were. There were, but they were quite different to the parties of today. We did, in the summer, of course, we did most of the sort of getting together ourselves. Um, in the summer of uh, 1910, I think it was. It was a wonderful summer, much too hot to play tennis. And we picked it on 28 out of the 31 days in August. Up in those days, the river hadn't been cleared and when there was a good tide, we could get up as far as Loch Nye. And we picnics up the river. I think we picnicked in every available place. And we had a pony and a governor's cart at that time. And I always drove in the cart with the provisions and so on. And Addis generally cycled with the crowd. We went to Barraglass and to uh, Glenmore and all the various bays and things round Muckled Head Muckled. and the Point of Air and Blue Point Muckled. Not Muckled. and uh, oh, what's that other one near uh, Belaf, Belaf Shore? Yeah. And how many of you? Twenty or twelve? Yes. Well, I know the one day up the river we were 28. Boys and girls, yes. or young men and women? Yes, well, boys and girls to begin with, mm. and they grew up. You see, our three cousins, Scott and the twins, were three, and there were four boys at Ballacurry, that was seven, and there were three holiday cousins named Broadbelt, who were... Uh, came here every summer for their holidays, stayed with the old Miss Shepherds, because the, the Miss Shepherds and their parents had been friends somewhere in Cheshire before the Shepherds came to live here. So that was ten boys, and we'd look for ten girls to go with us, you see, mm -hmm. and we got them, generally. Doesn't that remind you of Downton Abbey or something like that? It's, she paints this picture again of simple pleasures, picnicking, and I, I really love that. Um, anyway, I'll move on. Our final compilation, we're near the end now of our listening, so our final compilation, which um, I hope you enjoy as well. We came to Port Erin to the hotel named The Towers at Spaldrick in 1933 for our honeymoon. What are you going to tell them now? What are you up to? I don't know what you... What? 
What would it be? What would it be used for? If Douglas does take over, Uncle, <laughs> I'll be paying through the nose. But what I get for all that money is a thing that no one knows. Who ever records a media? No one. It's behind. The butchers, Needle the Green Grocers, Coven the Bakers, Thompson the Chip Shop, the Post Office, Newbury the, the Shoe Shop, Tag at the Drapers, an empty shop, Kerber the Baker, John James Clegg the Plumber, then the Wesleyan Chapel. You know, you can be across and uh, somebody will look at you funny because you're a girl wearing a leather jacket. It does not happen in Dial Man. Bikers are part of Dial Man's community and everybody, nobody bats an eyelid because you go about in a motorcycle. The, the mission here that we've got really is to cultivate that interest among the young people here especially while simultaneously building up the fluency of people here who speak Manx. Harry Boyd who was a tremendously fluent speaker of Manx. Tremendously fluent speaker. In fact, the difficulty was to get him to stop talking. <laughs> Did anybody recognise the voice of the penultimate person there, talking about the Manx language? No. Yes, that was Brian Stoll. And actually, I find this quite strange as well, because I believe his lecture was recorded, recorded here. We sadly lost, lost Brian recently. Um, a great advocate for the Manx, the Manx language, and we've got his full lecture talking about uh, learning the Manx language. Manx with physics, it's called, because he, he also studied physics. Um, and the Manx language um, features significantly in unlocking our sound heritage. Especially important are the recordings made of the native Manx Gaelic speakers, including those by Yincheshire Gilgach, a Manx society from 1951 to 1953. Harry Boyd, who Kevin Danner, Danner there mentioned in the final, the final piece we heard, he came over as part of the Irish Folklore Commission to record the speakers in around 1948. He met Harry Boyd. Um, Harry Boyd, he, he lived 1873 to 1953 was one of those speakers recorded. And he, here he is on, on the left. I, I love Harry Boyd, he's, he's great. Here's on the left, outside the Lexi Glen, Le, Le, Laxi Glen Hotel on Tinwald Day, 1939. We, so that's just to point out the fact that some of these people, we also have their photographs of them or we have other items related to them in our collections so that's another thing we're really keen to link the voices to the to the people we've also already heard part of a lecture by brian stoll which is mentioned on the manx language and its revival and the manx language recordings are being listened to and catalogued um, by my colleague um, and manx speaker Nicola Toombs and other Manx speakers on the island because you know unlocking those is 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 wonderful and hopefully you know helps helps the language now as well. Well, you'll be pleased to hear we are near the end now of our listening dive into just a very few of the unlocking our sound heritage sound recordings at Manx National Heritage, and I wanted to end on two opposite ends of the audible spectrum. First, noise is off. Who would be an oral history interviewer? I've listened to a few and I certainly not a job I, I could do. It, it takes a lot of skill. Often, he, she not only has had to develop the skills to interview and to listen, but also sometimes to ignore the everyday background noises of where they're sat, which to our ears adds wonderful authenticity to that moment in time. Now, we've catalogued these unintentional noises off as we've heard them because it's part of the sound archive. And I just wanted to share three of them for no other reason than they make me smile. Number one. And the budgie will become clear in a minute. The budgie will become clear. 
he cries me. Is, is that the phone? That's your telephone ringing. I think it's that one over there. Are they the same? Hello? Uh, could you actually, I've got a lady from Russian Abbey Gardens I'm having to talk to. Oh, okay. No worries, I'll talk to you later. All right, mate. Bye-bye. See how clever I am getting rid of people. Isn't that brilliant? You can actually hear the guy at your end. Hello? I love that. So that was my colleague, Nicola Toombs, and she remembers interviewing, interviewing that chap when the phone rang. Here's another. I've got a list there of the price of something. Uh, what, uh, what would you pay for a, for a goose? Say, if you wanted to buy a goose at Christmas, what would you pay for, for a goose? That's what I like about that just that sound of that clock. We've already heard that already. And you get that a lot. Who has a clock like that in their room anymore in the background? It says something about the, the place you're in, that sort of the sound of the ticking clock. And Rosemary Sale, but more often known as Rosie, everybody ran about, and those that come over. And the proprietor, one lady, the Sylvie Glen Hotel. So that's the sounds of the Solby Glen Hotel in the background. You can hear the tinkling of cups. But this is my favourite. And uh, I, I had help for washing up. When my own daughters grew up, they helped with waiting one. on, this, uh, because the school holidays coincided. Uh, <laughs> there goes the doorbell. <laughs> There goes the doorbell. So I was interviewing, interviewing the person, getting to the story, and the doorbell goes. This is my favourite one. Kirsty Neat interviewing Captain Harry Dunley at 2 Crotigaly on the 15th of February 1996. Right. Um, first of all, I just want to start off with a few personal details. Um, where were you born and when were you born? Colby. In Colby. In a little house. Right, almost opposite the Church there. I thought the Church. Right, right. That's his budgie. Um, our head of our head of our division now, Kirsty Neat, is the one conducting the interview with Captain Harry Kinley. And I mentioned this to her because this has done full, probably twenty odd years ago. She goes, "I remember doing that. I remember going to his place, and he had a budgie gar that just sang all the way through, and he also had a dog." that started barking and she said at one moment it was just impossible but for him he was used to the noises so he just carried on right I'm going to end now um, in linking with that final one we, we, we talked about the second end of the audible spectrum and this is a sound recording I wanted to end on just now we heard Cap Captain Harry Kinley's budgie well, in 1996, Captain Kinley was interviewed about his life at sea, including his involvement on the Isle of Man steam packet vessel, the Viking, that is the Viking, evacuating troops from France and children from Guernsey in 1940. He was there. It's a voice of someone who witnessed a world war firsthand. I find that very powerful. So let's just listen to just two very short clips from a much longer interview. We had ordered an enter Lee Hall to get troops on board immediately. We went in there that long so we could get these troops on board. And they're all Scottish, you see, all, all, all Scottish people. And they got their hand And them men have been chased from Dunkirk, mind you. And we got them on board, and we took the vice consul, vice consul of DF and his wife on board too. I will order these trips and over come Jerry, give her another broom to sleep. But, but, and, uh, when they come over, uh, an officer there blew a whistle, a soldier, you see, and all the soldiers dropped like that. But we were still gone. He was still looking. <laughs> <laughs> what was going on, you see? I don't know if you caught all of that because the recording isn't, isn't great, but it's one we might sort of try and do a bit more with. But he's describing picking up Scottish groups, troops from Le Havre uh, who'd already moved from Dunkirk. Um, and he describes the Germans strafing them as they're coming over and how the captain would blow the whistle for them to, you know, 
get down or you know take cover but he says we were just too busy watching you know this is a civilian at war civilians response to war and and this is what this next um uh clip uh, reveals as well hello Adenda into uh, St Peter's Port is alongside the jetty it's a beautiful place and here's a sight you never forget there's a barracks come across up to the top of the key, like I write the whole with the key. Beyond that, then there's over 1,800 children, 1,700 odd children. Some I haven't thought was wonderful. They had a gas mask and a little cup of bug and some sandwiches. Half of them were eaten by that. Then beyond that, then, or about 50 yards or more beyond them, there's a barbed wire and the parents were there, you see. Well, some kids were crying their hearts out. And I thought they were in a wonderful time running around, you see. But well, that's all those children in the 1800s. And the odd nun and the other people. But while we're loading these these children, something rather funny, a humorous again, a woman came staggering aboard, you see. And the officer, she said, Do you want the key? Is the key of my, uh, my pub, she said. It was called uh, a Miss, Mrs. Savage, and it was called the bull's head or something like that, you see. And you can have it. But I'm not going to give it to that bloody head unless you said. <laughs> <laughs> Did you catch that? Sorry, it's a bit, bit poor on this recording. So there's 1,800 children, he describes, getting on board, Guernsey, parents watching on, obviously fearful for the children, some children finding it a great adventure, having eaten all their sandwiches already. Um, I, think, I believe they were taken to Southampton. But then he describes a woman who was the landlady of the bull's head coming up the gangway, giving the captain a key to her pub, and saying, I want you to have it because I don't want that bloody Hitler getting it. And that, again, is a, a little moment that he's remembered and recalled from that time. So his longer interview is just wonderful. Anyway, well, we're at the end. You'll be pleased to hear. And today is a special day. Not only is it UNESCO World Day for Audiovisual Heritage, who knew? Um, but it is also the day when the nearly 600 sound art items, now all digitally preserved, are now being repacked over in uh, Belfast at the Ulster Folk Museum, where, where they've been for, for the year. And we're going to be bringing them, my colleagues are now over in Belfast, and tomorrow, boat permitting, they're going to be bringing the sound archive back to the Manx Museum. It's my colleagues, Emily and Katie, um, and they're going to be returning the sound archives to their temperature and humidity, tr humidity control store that we have at the museum, the conditions that they were also afforded for their year-long stay in the audio store in, in Belfast. Cataloguing will be complete by the end of November. With December, the team here working on rights clearance and checking for any sensitive material that we need to be aware of. In January 2022, um, we'll begin releasing the unedited, complete, because you've only heard clips today, so the unedited, complete digital sound recordings and the searchable catalogue onto imuseum.im for everyone to listen to, share and comment, comment on, download for free. In spring 2022, the British Library will launch their new sounds website, which will see our sound archive join that of Northern Ireland and the UK under the Unlocking Our Sound Heritage banner. And by doing so, reach an even wider audience, which is what this has all been about. And it doesn't end there with the online. In 2022, we're looking to do more sound-inspired events at the Manx Museum and around our sites, which I know some of you came to in the summer, so do look out for those. Be not afeared. The aisle is full of noises. And be not afeared to tell others about unlocking our sound heritage at Manx National Heritage. Thank you for listening.